Uh, it is a romping, kick-ass, R-rated action blockbuster book. I mean, if you want guns and monsters and shit blowing up, buy my books. <laughs> I'm also editing. No, I'm also editing a sword and sorcery anthology for Seven Star Press at the end of the year, and that'll be out second quarter of next year. And there's a lot of short fiction stuff I'm working on right now too. So you'll be seeing a lot of me as the next six months go out. I'm Stephanie Meyer, and uh, I'm Justin Mayberry. Uh, I write um, I, I write comics for Marvel. I write. Uh, th adult thrillers for St. Martin's, post-apocalyptic zombies for Simon Schuster, and other stuff I'm probably forgetting. Um, yeah, the comic book stuff. I'm, I'm having, an, I'm writing an Avengers miniseries right now where I basically kill all the Avengers. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also write nonfiction, I've written a number of nonfiction books about about the folklore of monsters. And I think that's it. Yeah, one of my books. And, oh, and my, my, zomb, my, my teenage zombie series, just, uh, we just sold the film rights, so I'm really happy. Oh. It's kind of, kind of new news, and I'm all excited about it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Donna Lynch. I am the uh, singer and co-writer and lyricist for the band Either Like Us, and I'm also a writer. Uh, I write ghost stories, primarily, for Raw Dog Screaming Fest and Thunderstorm Books. I'm Anya Martin. Am I supposed to be talking into the mic? You can do it. Because I'm not all that loud, so. I'm Anya Martin. I am probably mostly right now to you guys, if you know me as a short story author, and uh, I just did something called The Stuffed Bunny in Dollland for the Womanthology um, collection, comics collection, and I'm going to be talking about that a lot tomorrow at 11.30 on the Strong Women in Comics panel. Uh, so I did, that's a dark doll story. I've done several dark dolls and stuffed animals, of course, are the heroes. And dolls are really, really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I've written a number of short stories, and uh, I'm working on a novel right now. So. I am not a published author. I do own a nook, so I don't know if <laughs> anything or not. Uh, my name is Brian Small. I am an ordained priest in the uh, Catholic tradition, uh, assistant adjunct faculty at Emory University and uh, Pastor St. Peter and Paul uh, in Decatur, Georgia. So we have to watch our language, right? No. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, you mentioned your, one of your, your books here, and to kind of set the mood, I thought I would um, read a little bit out of the introduction out of this book called They Bite, which Jonathan co-wrote with someone named David Kramer. I don't know. Has he ever been here? Uh, <laughs> no, he, he hasn't. But, he, but uh, we want to stoke her together for one of our books. Oh, well, there you go. They're out there, in the shadows, moving out of sight in the darkness, or darting away from the corner of our eye. And yet we can feel them watching us with, with hungry eyes. Supernatural predators that haunt our nightmares and even creep into our waking lives. What are they? What do they want? Where do they come from? Are they real or figments of our collective imagination? These predators appear in all cultures and in many forms, from the seemingly beautiful and seductive to the hideous and repellent. We've always believed in monsters, and they appear in all myths, all religions, and all kinds of folklore. Our holy books are as full of them as our, as our epic poems and campfire tales. They fly on leathery wings or slither through the grass. They stalk the countryside on twisted goat legs or lope along through shadowy ruins on great clawed feet. But they're all monsters, and they all want to take a bite. Is that a, is that a good intro? Or what? <laughs> I wrote that. What's that? I wrote that. I'm afraid so. <laughs> 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 I don't know what I'm just saying. It was good. But I thought that that just gave kind of a good way to, a good spring for the board for us to start from. That obviously monsters have to be creepier. We wouldn't be afraid of them. But what, I, what we're going to talk about tonight is have each one of you um, talk a bit about what kinds of monsters or, or supernatural beings do you see being as, as being most reflective of contemporary society? What are, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, zombies or whatever, but is there, is there a particular kind of monster that you think is particularly reflective? And James, we'll start with you. Of oh, society as a whole? Well, just of contemporary of our contemporary society, why do why is one kind of monster more popular, perhaps? In the zeitgeist. Right. right. 
Uh, well, I mean, I've been told that vampires are done to death, and no. I don't agree. I think that vampires are always going to resonate with people because they touch on such a vast part of our morals. Like, especially, I had a friend who said that if you read werewolf tales, those are about violence. If you read vampire tales, those are about sex. And because we all have a sexual component to us, I think that vampires are always going to be able to A, be exploited in every type of direction they could go, from the sexy, sparkly vampires to the <laughs> face-off vampires, that's all going to resonate with someone in, in the world. But they also are always going to resonate in some way with somebody. And I don't think they're ever going to go out of style. I uh, totally agree with you about the vampires. <clears throat> From, for two different reasons. One, um, vampires will go out of style when writers forget how to use their imagination, and that's not going to happen. As long as, as long as there are writers out there who can come up with some new twist, there's always going to be a new vampire uh, story. Uh, it, to say otherwise would, 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 is kind of, kind of naive. Uh, imagine somebody saying, well, there can't be a new love story because we've done that already. Yeah. <laughs> or there, there can't be a new crime drama, we've done that. Well, no, it's, you can always twist something new. Um, my, one of my favorite monsters, though, uh, other than since you already talked about vampires, is zombies. I love zombies. The most the scientific type, meaning they're not supernatural, um, and, and the supernatural version. I, I, I love all aspects of it uh, for exactly the, the reason that I, I, I don't read as much, say, uh, vampire fiction. Quick explanation. Vampires have uh, used to be the monster. Now they become the story. We've written about them so much, we've personalized them so much, romanticized them, we've made them versions of us who are a little more interesting than us. Uh, so they become the story. You know, uh, two, two, three thousand years ago, they were they were the demigods or gods of, of you know Olympus or or whatever. Now they're our our demigods. We write about them, uh, but zombies don't have a personality for the most part. Uh, they're they're a blank. They they represent a massive shared threat, and we all have to deal with that threat at the same time. It's the same frequency of threat. It's there, it's, it's, it's affecting everyone. So once you've introduced the zombie, you can actually take the focus away from the zombie for most of the story and, talk, and, and examine how people deal with a massive shared threat. And people in threat or, or in, in crisis, that's the basis of drama. So that monster, um, as scary as it can be, also allows for the greatest variety in storytelling because there's no end to uh, the potential for stories that are just basically dramatic explorations of, of people in crisis. Walking Dead. Walking Dead, for example. Right, I, I was actually just going to say that um, I, I like zombies, but they scare the crap out of me. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I watch The Walking Dead with my fingers in my ears. I don't have my eyes because it's the, it's the, the music. It's that jump that gets me. So I have to cover my ears and watch it. But, um, you know, to me that show is, is not to turn this into a Walking Dead discussion, but it is a essentially a soap opera with zombies. Yeah. Right. Because, exactly. you know, there's zombies which are secondary. And I love that about it, actually, because I really don't want to watch a, you know, 72 hour long zombie movie. Like, you know, that gets old pretty fast, so I do like that about it. Um, but for me personally, I, I said in the introduction that I write ghost stories, and the reason that I do that is because um, I, I have dealt with long histories of mental illness, both in myself and in my family, and, the, and ghosts are, to me, the most accurate representation of what it feels like to have something wrong with you that you can't see to have something haunting you, to have something that is always in your brain and it always feels like it is around you and it consumes you. You can't see it, you can't, you don't know how to get rid of it. You know, you, you're just enveloped in this entity. And of all of the iconic monsters that are in the world, the idea of a ghost embodies that for me the best. So. I'm going to try to use the mic again, because <laughs> I don't think I carry as well. I love what you said about ghosts, and if you think about the popularity of American Horror Story last year on TV, maybe that speaks to some of that as well. Because that, 
But I do think the obvious on the, uh, I agree with everybody, that the obvious, if you look at the bookshelves, is vampires and zombies. You know, um, and I was going to make a couple comments about, about each, um, and sort of, I think it, it becomes challenging for authors to be creative with that. But I think the vampire novels you talked about with, you know, the sex aspect, vampire novels have been kind of reduced to romance novels now, very much so, and they become like into the, themselves, and the vampire isn't necessarily scary even. You know, uh, with, once you get to Twilight and so forth, I uh, I like the fact that with Vampire Diaries, they actually try to at least sort of keep them a little scarier or or, or violent, and deal with that. Um, I think there are two other reasons why vampires are fascinating and sort of continuing. One is this just our fear of death and this fascination with eternal life and how can you you get eternal life but at a cost. And I think the weakness of some vampire stories is they give up, they don't talk about the cost, which Anne Rice did. I'm, I'm not necessarily a huge Anne Rice fan in some ways. I, I think some of her books fail. But with Interview with a Vampire, they do talk about the cost of that, that whole moral cost that you are killing in order to, to get that. The other thing is addiction, which is a complex problem in our society right now and continues to be and has been throughout time. So, and vampirism and the addiction to blood. Um, with regard to zombies, um, I was going to say, I'm sure 9-11 and there are like just sort of feeling of anything can happen to you anytime at the mall or, you know, <laughs> or, or wherever you go. Zombies are something like that. They happen suddenly and unexpectedly. Suddenly, you are you have to protect yourself. So I do think it is maybe zombies really are the monster of our times even more. Vampires are popular, but they're kind of escapism, and the zombies are actually um, that. But I think the challenge for writers is to take these. If you're interested, you you can enjoy all some of these. You know, you can enjoy those vampire novels. You can enjoy their now a zombie novel everywhere. But can you do something interesting with that? And you know, when you look at, like, say, John, Al uh, I can never pronounce his middle name, but John Lindquist, who did Let the Right One In, and also who did a zombie novel as well, it, it's really a different, uh, a different take. I mean, he uses vampirism to talk about bullying, and the zombie novel, the zombies, instead of when, when you become a zombie, um, you come, uh, they come home. So they rise from the dead, and they go home. So they show up on your doorstep, and there's your loved one. Who's a zombie showing up on your doorstep? And they're not really hurting you. They're not actually killing you. They're just dead, and they're on your doorstep, and they're not like you. It's like you know, maybe having an Alzheimer's patient or someone with dementia. It's anyway, and that book, I'm like forgetting the title of. Do you remember? Handling the Undead. Yeah. 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 Gene Simmons, uh, Courage of Broken Stones was the same idea. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me in the back? <laughs> okay. Um, I think. You know, if we zoom out for a second, we have to ask the question, what is fear? Fear is the relinquishing of control to something or someone else. If you're afraid of something, you're giving it control over you. It's influencing your actions. Sometimes that fear is a good thing. That way you don't put your hand in the fire. You don't step out in traffic. But um, actually, just about two days ago, I watched for the first time from start to finish Jaws. And I've seen it hundreds <laughs> of times. But in bits here, chunks there, and it's the first time in you know, 38 years that I've watched it from start to finish. And I can't imagine what it, would, what it was like to go swimming before that movie came out. <laughs> because it definitely transformed our understanding and our experience of what it meant to go swimming in the ocean. Is that it, it somehow, it, it awoke, it brought up from the sediment uh, a very, very deep, you know, people did not swim recreationally until um, the mid eight, early to eight, mid 1800s, um, because they were just, you weren't sure what were you gonna find in the water. But um, I think it's, with the zombie literature, it's interesting that if you look at um, some of the literature in Italy around the time of the plague, it really reads very similar. Uh, the, the desolation, the, the, the abandoned homes, the, um, uh, that, that loss of continuity. And, um, and I, I think if you look uh, throughout history, whenever there's a paradigm shift, especially an involuntary one, uh, from, a, uh, from, from an Abrahamic tradition, uh, you look at the destruction of the temple uh, in the year 70, and, and what is, how does that change, and how does the society, how does the religion mold and shift around that? Um, 
there's a point there and I forgot it. Damn, this is my third panel in a row, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, that sense of desolation. And so I think that the monsters speak to that sense of loss. And that sense of now what? What do we do now? Whether it's zombies um, or anything else. You know, one thing that's interesting is, you know, you look at the exorcist that came out, again, 35 we're getting close to 40 years ago now. But just like in the last three years, four years, I mean, you have Emily Woe's The Last Exorcism. There's one that came out, um, this, that comes out this weekend. Yeah. Um, and so and I think, you know, what does that talk about? Our, our need and our desire and our want for control and the idea that somehow our control and our free will, our choices are compromised. And you're know, talking about addiction and mental illness. Um, because we, we become a, uh, a people who exalt the individual. And so the idea that the individual's rights or the individual's control can somehow be compromised, um, I think, I guess, again, that seems to be in the zeitgeist. So, I... There, there's been a lot of talk in the last several years, you know, since 9-11 and probably even before that, but when things seem to get a little more bleak in contemporary society, it's all of a sudden people are more interested in paranormal fiction of all kinds, and I don't, I, I just mean, you know, urban fantasy, horror, however you want to look at it, even the paranormal romance, any of those things, and do you, do you have, do you, do you think that there's a connection to that, or what, what do you think is the, you know, the connection between those two things, and I'll start with you, Jim. The connection between? The fact that the people feel, you know, you're talking about the desolation. Or, or you know, that there, there's something, yeah. Or, and somebody said escapism, and you know, and do you think that that has helped feed the recent resurgence? Well, I, in I do think when you live in a time that can be as scary as what we are now, not that past generations didn't have their own scares. I mean, can you imagine life in America after Pearl Harbor? Right. I mean, that had to be very much like 9/11. But we act like, you know, we're the ones, because it's so immediate to us, we're the only ones that have ever been scared of starting our car or going down the subway or whatever. Um, I do think that that kind of low-level fear that America can have sometimes does feed into wanting to read very escapist stuff, even if it has kind of a horror base, which does lead to a lot of urban fantasy being sold. You know, you can't strap up with guns against terrorists, but if there was a zombie or a... You know, a vampire or a werewolf, maybe you could do something because you could be in a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of it speaks to, to um, the way in which we address our own feelings of powerlessness. Um, if, if we, at, at times when, when the economy's balanced and there, are, there aren't major wars going on and, and everything seems to be in better shape, we tend to write stories you know, with anti heroes, we tend to write stories um, where the bad guy wins, you know, um, but when we have real bad guys, and the, the world is, is in real trouble as it is now in so many different areas. Um, we tend to write stories in which our characters impose some degree of order on them. And we generally don't write um, stories, you know, as, as you mentioned, we don't write, we can't strap on a gun and go, go shoot a terrorist. And we generally don't write as many books about that either. I mean, yeah, yeah there are thrillers about it. I write some thrillers about that sort of thing. But, he, but most of, of the horrific genre tends to focus on monsters that can be conquered within the, the scope of a book. It's hard to write a novel in which you realistically end terrorism. But you can write a novel in which you realistically kill a werewolf. Uh, you know, and that threat's done. So we create monsters that we can defeat. And it makes it, makes it very easy for us to feel good about ourselves because we feel empowered because our proxy characters in, in the story are actually winning the day. Um, and also, sometimes those characters are more powerful than we are because we feel disempowered. So we want to re read about a kick-ass bounty hunter who's, who's out fighting monsters, or um, a, uh, a chosen one who has you know abilities to stop you know anything comes out of the hell mouth. You know, we want to read about characters who are more powerful versions of ourselves. They're, those characters are usually damaged emotionally, psychologically, uh, certainly in terms of relationships, and that they're a stand-in for us, and they fight things that are more powerful, and at the end of the story, they have conquered that thing. And they've done that for us, and we feel that we have, you know, if we were in that place, maybe we could have conquered something too. So it's, it's, it's about reclaiming our power. So. 
I think it's a big part of it. Yeah, I um, I agree. I also think for, I know for me personally though, I go completely the opposite direction. My characters become the monsters. Mm -hmm. Um, or it's just not possible to win. It, it becomes a situation that isn't about winning or losing. It just becomes an assimilation situ you know, situation. And I think one of the reasons that I do that for myself is, you know, that own fear, my own fear of knowing or believing that at the end of the day, you know, I am going to become that thing that I fear the most, which is dead. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's kind of my own, it's my own, it's my therapy in a way. Because I, I you know, without getting into major religious, spiritual beliefs or anything like that, I mean, it's, it, it, things, like you were saying, things you can't control, those are the things you fear the most. And, you know, spiraling towards your own mortality and, and facing that. Um, you know, without, I, I don't want to sound like a, a pessimist or a nihilist, but I, you know, I kind of feel like there is no way out of that. It's, it's going to come. So my characters tend to embrace it and become their monster. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a very interesting thought, and I think it would be great to maybe go on that, but I wanted to say something about the timing. I was doing some thinking about it. I didn't say that I've also done a lot of nonfiction. I've written about horror movies and so forth, and I and I was just thinking about the different time periods in history. And let's we going away from literature. Let's if we go to movies. The 1930s was the, the era of the Depression. Was the time of the great Universal horror movies. But during World War II, if you think about it. What were horror movies like? They were Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Horror movies in the 40s were not as powerful and not as scary, yet that was the time of World War II. So in essence, at that time when we had the Nazis that we were fighting, we didn't have great horror movies. So we were in a time of crisis. But let's go to the 1950s, and what were all the movies about? The atomic, the radiation. Suddenly we had, again, not all, they weren't all great, but we had powerful, there was a powerful theme in horror movies with regard to the atom bomb. There was a response, direct response to the atom bomb, which of course would have been 1945, and there was a delay, I guess, in doing that. And of course in Japan, really, the Godzilla movies, the Kaiju Aiga, um, are a real response to that, and where, where they had a personal experience with it. So I think those are just interesting things for you to think about. Uh, why in the 1940s? during a time of great crisis, did we not have great horror movies? Um, and I'm sure you could come up with an exception. We always, there always are. But, uh, but the 30s and the 50s were more were poignant times for, for horror. And I'm not gonna bring it up to the present because enough people have said what about that. But. Although just to build on that a little bit, I think you know, the idea of during the 40s, during this time of post Pearl Harbor, you know, this, this sense of when everybody's feeling afraid, that like doing Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein is the equivalent of the ridiculous charm. Right. It's <laughs> taking your monster and turning it into something laughable, and so you're taking you're taking power back. Um, so what was the original thing about cataclysm and what happens afterwards, or? <laughs> <laughs> or just how people in times of crisis react like emotional or economic or some other kind of distress turn to, you know, being really into this whole the idea of supernatural monsters. Well, I think ultimately we're looking for a narrative that offers some sense of cause and effect, but we're looking for a narrative that empowers. Again, the sense that if fear is giving power to something else, then how do we get that power back? Uh, whether personally, corporately, uh, collectively. Um, and I think, I mean, to me, I mean, like Battlestar Galactica, definitely just weeks of, of a post-9-11 narrative. Um, you know, look at the destruction of the colonies. What now? What do we do? Because it wasn't just about the two towers, it's about the worldview behind it. And I think there's, you can draw a lot of parallels. Not just between that, um, but like prior to that, you know, the big, the big sci-fi thing was the Matrix. Um, and that's about, 
I think you can talk about the immersion of the, uh, the explosion of the internet as something that really is part of it, and what's the shadow side of that? Um, so whereas before technology was not on, say, the enemy, but the technology was the unknown, then after 9-11, uh, it becomes that, that sense of desolation is, is much more palpable. The question about the 40s, what occurred to me when you were saying that, is in the 40s, there was an actual real monster. It was a human being. And so why not make something funny? You know, just to not have to think about that. Yeah, I mean, in the movie Dracula, Dracula kills three people. Then you have Hitler. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dracula film really wouldn't have scared much in, in, when, when that's you know, on the news. Well, and one before it was shown, you know, footage of concentration camps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's here's, hard to follow that up. Here's something I'm kind of wondering, though, because it, it still doesn't um, really address what, what she was saying. And I, I kind of agree. I mean, I'm not a huge, you know, film expert, but it, you know, it didn't seem like in the 40s that there was, that people were really turning to genuinely terrifying things. Oh, it makes total sense because, like, like you were saying, we did have a real monster, but we also have had real monsters now. But here's kind of what I'm thinking. Maybe the difference is, is that, you know, I think towards the end, in the last days of World War II, I think we kind of felt like the good guys had a handle on it. Like, we were, gonna, we were doing it. We were going to do it. And it seems like nowadays, you know, because the political climate is what it is and it's so divided and there's just so much uncertainty that maybe we are, even though, you know, we've had the, the real monsters again come up, but now we are embracing and returning to horror again a little bit more because we don't feel as in control of the situation. And I mean, I'm really speculating. Yeah. Obviously, I wasn't alive at the end of World War II. But, you know, I, I don't. I mean, that's kind of the impression I get. Like maybe it was, you know, everybody was using it. Like we're going to turn this into something laughable because we've had this monster, but now we're kicking ass and we have this under control. Right. Well, so, I, and, yeah. well, I think what it is is in the '40s, we had a face to evil. We had Hitler and we had yeah. the Axis and all that stuff. Now we have terrorists, but do you ever really see them until they blow some shit up? Right. right. <laughs> and that was true in, in, in yeah. the 50s, too, because you know, there is no face to radiation. There is exactly. no face, really, to communism. Um, th those are threats that were kind of nebulous and out there. So we, we created versions of them with giant monsters and alien invasions and pod people um, in order to give a face to, to something so that we could explore how we would handle that, that type of fear. Yeah. And it's not just horror. I think one of the reasons that 24 was so good, besides the fact that it was awesome, <laughs> is that you could watch Jack Bauer kick a terrorist ass and be like, yes, yeah. we can do this. Right. And really, you just have to watch out getting on the subway in New York. Right. Uh, the world view. I mean, you look at the 40s, even the, remember the G.I. Joe cartoon? Blue yep. lasers, good. Red lasers, oh, bad. <laughs> G.I. Joe only used blue lasers and Cobra only used red lasers. And you know, the idea of, of terrorism, like war on terrorism is like a war on jealousy or a war, a war on being mean. Terrorism is a tactic. It's not, and I think, you know, I'm going to get real political and I'm sorry, but and I think one of the great mistakes of the last administration was this idea to talk about the terrorist like it was Cobra. <laughs> um, and it's, it's no, right. and, and that it's about the enemy. It, no. it, it is a means to yeah. um, and, and, and that and that it's a defeatable enemy. Yeah. You know, it, mm -hmm. some unrealistic expectation. Yeah. Can, can I just throw something out there? Because the other thing we haven't talked about really is the serial killer, which has been in society now. This this total the individual. Thing. We're talking about the, this group threat, but there's also this individual threat that you can walk down the streets of Atlanta, just go in a dark place, and if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, the child will. You know, because nobody takes their children out today. You kids, we used to run all over the neighborhood. Now you have to have those play dates. Mm -hmm. There's no creek exploration expeditions anymore. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, maybe there's some cool parents who are trusting of that. I was taught not to talk to strangers and stay away from them. Um, but even I have like an incident I remember of a creepy guy in a green sedan who pulled up next to me when I was walking home from school and said, do you want to look at my rubber thumb? <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, oh, I was like, what went through my head was, the, you know, magic shops, rubber thumbs, that's what went through my head. 
And it wasn't until later, I didn't even tell, I was so embarrassed. I mean, he kept pulling up next to me and I kept like going, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna run away, what am I gonna be? I don't wanna be the girl in the level, well, there was no lovely bones, but that's why I have trouble with the lovely bones actually, it's because of that happening to me. I don't think it's, I don't think you end up as an angel looking down, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Argue with me about it later, why that's a good thing. Uh, I think it's a horror story that ends at the end of chapter two and is a real horror story. Uh, but, but on the other hand, you know, my mother said to me years later, um, she said, you know, that wasn't really a rubber thumb. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> At that moment, it was a terrible moment. <laughs> yes, like, that was a moment of horror when I suddenly thought of it. But I just wondered if, if you know, how that individual... And I guess the vampires fit into that, but they aren't the serial killer anymore. No. The vampires no. were the serial killer, well, and they're not there, anymore. There are, there are some writers uh, who are moving vampires back to being scary. I yeah. think there are, and I yeah. think that's that's very... I, 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 I actually edited an anthology um, called V Wars, which just came out about a month ago, uh, which is scary vampires. Uh, and it's we, we got Nancy Holder and a few other writers to, mm -hmm. to, to kick in some stories, and the whole idea was Vampires aren't pretty, they aren't romantic, they're scary as hell. Let's write that. 30 Days of Night vampires are one of my favorite oh, yeah. sets of vampires yeah. because they scared me yeah. so bad. And I was like, that's what I want a vampire to do. I want it to yeah. make yeah. me afraid. They're the big bad. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's just an impulse driven, crazed yeah. machine. Like, right. there's no, you know, there's no romance there. It's like, it just needs to eat. In fact, in, in so many of the, of the vampire, uh, Species, there's hundreds of different vampire beliefs around the world, you can call them species for convenience sake, um, <laughs> that uh, they, some of them use a glamour uh, for seduction, but they're not falling in love with you. It's, it's, it's no different than um, a Venus flytrap using a sweet scent to lure a fly in. It's a destructive thing. And that, that's why so, so many writers, I think, use that as a, uh, the seduction of the vampire, uh, and as, uh, using it as a metaphor for rape also. Because it, you know, in the early stories, it was not a pleasant thing. We've since romanticized it, but it's that GHB. wasn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I took my vampires back to classic, you know, for lack of a better term, Catholic vampires who will eat your face off. I mean, they're like sharp on two legs. They just go around and seduce you a little bit to get you close and, you know, eat your face off. So is the vampire the equivalent of the serial killer, the response, or is a different monster the equivalent of the serial killer, or is the serial killer just so human and sober that it's a monster to itself that's not supernatural? I actually have a really precise answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was researching Day Bite and a few of the, a couple of the other nonfiction books I read on folklore, uh, one of the things we did is we read some of the transcripts of um, werewolf cases from the 14, 15, 1600s. In Germany. In Germany, Italy. Um, they're serial killers. I mean, for the most part, the person did not actually turn into a wolf. They acted like a beast. And um, they hid their prey. They did all the things that, that a serial killer does. They were very clever and cunning and so on. What they Two were birthday doing parties. Was, What's it? A few birthday parties. Yes. <laughs> they claimed <laughs> change. Uh, what, what, what they were doing is, is describing what we later had a name for, which is serial killers. But the werewolf legend is, is largely built on the model of the the multiple murderer or the serial killer, and um, if you know, if you ever get a chance to read some of those transcripts, they're out there. They're, they're it, if they read like modern trans transcripts of like a Ted Bundy or Ned Gein, they read like those types of transcripts. Well, in the supernatural dimension, uh, some scholars say it's just because of the uh, hallucinogenics found and the poor quality of the bread that the working class ate because it wasn't filtered flour, mm -hmm. uh, and that the things they were eating uh, made them highly susceptible to uh, hallucinations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but if you were, you know, several hundred years ago, and you had a village and somebody was a serial killer, well, you wouldn't believe it was, you know, Baker, or Miller, or whoever, or whoever it was. Yeah. Yeah, you would think it has to be a monster. It has to be a wolf from outside, because it couldn't be the guy that lives right down the dirt lane for me. Well, that ties right into, you know, don't talk to strangers. Yeah. Yeah. Or the idea is that, you know, a sexual predator was something outside. Yeah. Something, and the fact that, you know, most children who are sexually abused are abused by their fathers, their, their second father, stepfather, or as a teacher, or a clergy, or... <laughs> hey, hey, I'm owning it, I'm sorry. Um, and, but it, it's not something external. 
right. uh, and, and that there are monsters in our midst, yeah. and then how do we handle that? And, and also, uh, a lot of what have become our monster legends, uh, monster beliefs, can be traced back to an attempt to explain the unexplainable. Good example, uh, you put a little child to bed, a healthy kid, next morning the kid's dead. There's no signs of uh, violence, you know, it's such a sudden infant death syndrome. You can't, uh, people, you know, living in the 1400s are not going to believe that um, a, a healthy child just died. They certainly are not going to believe that God allowed the child to die or killed the child. They would have to believe that something that is anti-God, something that is evil, came in and stole the child's life breath away. So it's and by believing in a monster, it's easier to accept the order of the universe because if you know you believe in good, you believe in evil, nice little balance there. If something evil does harm to you, you can go and pray and you can go to church and you can be you know a, a good Christian or, or whatever religion you're with. And the odds on it happening in sudden death syndrome seldom happens twice in the same family. Your next child doesn't die because your 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 faith is stronger. And we now know what the monster was, and we know how to protect ourselves against the monster. Uh, you know, a lot of the religious rituals were built to protect ourselves against evil. Um, we we often create our own monsters, and they help us. They help balance our universe. They they they, they give us a sense of order, in a way. Coping. Coping. And, and one last thing, Nosferatu. You know the word Nosferatu? Yeah. Bram Stoker defined it as undead. It actually means plague carrier. Um, in, in Romania, um, the word described invisible vampiric spirits that would come and cause diseases. And a lot of diseases, a lot of plagues were believed to be uh, the work of an evil force. Because again, you can't believe that that shit just happens randomly. So it's got to be something evil. And it, it's our way of explaining that. Are witches less popular now, or are they popular? Secret I, Circle didn't do very well. What are the monsters that aren't popular well, right I, now, and why is that like? I think in our, I yeah. think in you know today's world, it's much harder you know to to identify with a witch as a monster. We've <laughs> had so many different. Um, you know, so many so many people being much more open about you know. From a pagan, you know, Wiccan from a pagan perspective and everything, and I, you know, I get that, and that's not necessarily what we're talking about. But I like, I do like the old witches. I like Baba Yaga. I like the old witches of folklore that were indeed monsters, very, very much so. Um, and you know, a lot of times they all have this very, you know, mothering attribute to them, which just makes it that much more sinister because this is something that's supposed to protect you and take care of you. And instead, it just wants to eat you, you know. And um, you know, I kind of do. I, I do miss those. I do miss those popping up in, in contemporary literature and, and films because I think they were really, really scary. I've written short stories about that. I've even written songs about, you know, which you know, just that witches. I mean, real like real witches, old witches. Old school. Old school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put that any weekend. I'm going to say, you know, yeah. you know not Those aren't old school. It's, it's, it's a different thing. Well, I, in the third book, which comes out in March. <laughs> 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 You're so prepared. I can't well, it's, it's called Blood and Magic, and it is a small coven of satanic witches roll into town, and Deacon has to fight them. So I went back to the. 70s kind of, not on Tom Bay, but like satanic witches, and they have big Baphomet pinnacles, and they're doing like, in the name of Satan spells. I mean, it's they're fun. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's not Wiccan at all. It's yeah. not pagan in any way. It's very much satanic. Why is it college? Well, do you think that there are any kind of classic monster representations that are timeless and aren't necessarily a reflection of a particular Era, and I mean, we've been talking about vampires a lot. That you know, that, that they seem to be, they, they seem to be one of the types of supernatural beings that are kind of evolving all the time. There seem to be more of that going on. Although with zombies, I gotta say that seems to be going on as well. But but is there a particular classic depiction of a you know a specific one that you think is Frankenstein's monster? <laughs> 
I was actually going to say Frankenstein's monster or a golem or any type of homunculus. Hum, oh, yeah. Yes, I can never pronounce that word. Homunculus, that's yeah. a neutral person. Yeah. Well, it's like, uh, but it's, it's an artificial person. I mean, any of, any of those kind of like. Galvanized yeah. revenant. Yes. <laughs> any of those kind of things, I, you know, I don't think they really speak that much. I mean, Frankenstein was kind of like science is scary, so let's write a scary story Which about really, it. Which really kind of seems, there's a lot of parallels there, I mean, with, yeah. with zombies now. Like, right. I mean, obviously yeah. he's not a zombie in the traditional sense, but it is that, that sense of science gone wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we pushed things too far. And, you know, I mean, depending on what kind of zombie you're talking about. The rage about, virus kind. Yeah, it's like you just push a it too far. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, to me, if I, if I had to really start categorizing classic monsters in a more um, contemporary way, like, I, that's sort of where I would put that character. Yeah, I, I don't know if we actually have a classic monster that's going to be the monster for the masses anymore. Um, there, there are too many people who are out there creating really cool stuff in so many different areas. If, if we have something that's going to be our new monster, it is actually probably going to be science going wrong. Um, you know, we have a lot of these plague stories out there, but often it's something got out of a lab, or it's, some, or it's science slash politics being the villain. Um, World War Z, good example, you know. Uh, plague gets out and it was mishandled and you know, therefore, it becomes a threat. The movie can date Contagion, the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, and that that gathers in its net also the rage virus stories uh, and a lot of other similar things where it's it's science gone wrong. You know, and, and we're going to see more types of science gone wrong. It won't be necessarily supernatural, but it will be monsters. Terminator was a good example. Science gone wrong. Um, there's a, a book coming out about predator drones, uh, where the AI, you know gets a little freaky and starts attacking. Um, things like, uh, I mean, one of the a great horror story that would affect most people in this room would, would be somebody who could shut down the internet. That would scare the bejesus out of me. And EMP Pulse is another one, and there are several books out about that. Science, I think, is the new monster. And it's funny, everything that's old is new again. We're getting scared of science again. So. Well, one of the most terrifying and amazing books that I've read in years is The Road. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I oh, yeah. I think it didn't uh, scare me, but it was beautiful. I love that. It should have been sold with a, with a bottle of antidepressants, though. Oh, no. I read The Road before I do any revisions because the language is so freaking beautiful. I just I cry. It's, yeah, it's gorgeous. It, it's, it scared Corbin. me, and it made me cry, and it, just, it made me think because it's, it's almost impossible to read that book and not put yourself in that position. Yeah. You know, it... Yeah. If or when it happens, you know, yeah. and, that, and that's that fear of like, you know, at any point, everything could just go totally wrong, yeah. and we are left with virtually nothing, none of our comforts, none of our safeties, none of, you know, it's, you're just out there, right. and you get a sense with, with pieces like that of how vast the world is and how it does not care about any single one of us. Well, that's back to the desolation that we talked about earlier. And I think, well, A, the road really spoke to me because not only is the language beautiful, but I have a son. So it's like I could be like, oh, yeah, me and my son are the only ones left. I have to protect him in this world I can't protect him from. That's scary stuff. But I think the desolation and that kind of isolation is also why the Cthulhu mythos seem to be coming back. You're kind of yeah, you're kind of like an insignificant human in the face of this monstrosity. Yeah, we were created as a cosmic joke. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I'm sorry. I was gonna say, but has Lovecraft really ever gone away? In a way, Lovecraft is back huge now. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. movies, there's stuff. I mean, uh, my father is uh, is in first fandom. Has been reading Lovecraft since like the '30s. So, um, so I've like grown up with Lovecraft. But it seems to me that I mean, he says that Lovecraft is the most like now of American authors, he's the most written about of all American authors People. now with the quantity of literary criticism that's been written about him, not just in the United States, the French love him, English, you know, et cetera. It's, it's, it's amazing. And yet he wrote pretty turgid prose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, his his <laughs> reputation as a, as a crafter of worlds is much better than his actual ability to write a story. Exactly. Yeah. But it's interesting because the idea is, I mean, I've just written my first Lovecraftian story. 
Me too. And I, and it's, and I used the, I mean, the, the idea of tentacle monsters to deal with, um, I don't really want to say exactly what, because I want you to read it and not, uh, not give anything away, but to deal with a really human, individual type of problem, sort of like what you were talking about, what you've done with ghosts. You know, taking a, taking something that you might know somebody, a situation you might really be in, but instead of writing about it in a realistic fashion, there's some little tentacle creatures that are that are sitting in for for the whole circumstance and um, and convey it. And and it's just amazing, you know, that you can do that with with. I think Lovecraft's very flexible because my story is not about just crushing worlds. It's it's a, it's a story about a couple, two people, right. and it's the destruction of a relationship through using that device. Well, you know, I, 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 I so agree that uh, Lovecraft, the Cthulhu mythos and, and its extended world, is one of those, those things that is no longer a subgenre, but it's become its genre. And there's, there's no end. I mean, everyone has written a Cthulhu story, and everybody wants to write a Cthulhu story. You know, that, that's one of those things that, you know, it used to be that you had to write a Sherlock Holmes story. Now you have to write a Cthulhu story. You know, that, that, that's your... That gets you into the, into the cool part of the playground. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Stuffed toys. It, yeah. it looks nice from what I've heard. And, 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 and every story is, I mean, there's so many that are so completely different. I can't wait to read yours. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, we have some time now. If you in the audience have some questions for the panel. Ooh, you know, lots of hands. Okay, right great. here with the. Your uh, I'm trying to see what it is. It's kind of a glare. So. Um, <laughs> Question for the panel. One thing that I see when we talk about the monsters of this day and what's popular and what we're talking about, they're all human related. A vampire is a human twisted by a demon or souls twisted or something like that. A zombie is a human that's been reanimated or however you want to look at it. A ghost is what used to be a human or something like that. Do you think that when you look at the 50s, even though know, we had the radiation, it was nature. Nature scared the crap. I mean, there were killer plants, killer ants, killer spiders. I mean, you name it, killer iguanas, kill monsters. Technology. And do you think because we've moved into such a technological world and we see the world as just us, that that's why you don't see nature being used as a monster? Well, it would be really hard to make giant ants scary. <laughs> I mean, what was the last you giant? Say that. <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, I mean, in real life, they'd be scary as hell. Oh, yeah. What was, oh, the, what was that last movie they did? The Eight-Legged Freaks. I mean, yeah. that was not scary. But what was the, yeah, the M Night Shyamalan? The, the last one. The happening. Oh. The happening. Oh, did that suck? <laughs> yeah. and that was the plants, right? The yeah. plants revolted. Yeah, the plants yeah. made oh, yeah, yeah. kill yeah. yourself. That's yeah. right. I guess I kind of feel, you know, like what he's saying, like that that sort of thing has become, you know, such a, it, it's a parody of itself. Like it, it's too over the top yes. and and almost silly anymore to actually be scary because we've grown so accustomed to that thing becoming camp. Yeah. You know, Night of um, was, I think, the end of the giant monster. <laughs> the giant <laughs> killer <laughs> carnivorous rabbits. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and it was not played for, as a joke. But, but also, we, we outgun those things. Yeah. I mean, one Black Hawk helicopter, and you can have as many giant ants as you want. They're going to sit up there 20 feet above them and fire Hellfire missiles. <laughs> uh, we're not as scared of them any, a, a, anymore. We're more afraid of the things you can't point a gun at, like a, like a virus. You can't point a gun at it. I don't think radiation isn't so mysterious anymore as it was in the 50s. Yeah. No. Yeah, we think it's good now. We want it. We think because it'll kill, well, this, from that point of view, yes. But we also, we also kind of okay with some of those bombs. We're kind of like thinking now, well, maybe that'll be okay because we've kind of forgotten. I think about, think of an atomic, if there really was an atomic attack, things would change again. Well, we'll oh, yeah. we have if changed. If there really is, someone actually put off a bomb, then suddenly we, we might be a little bit. Yeah. Well, we have changed our fear of radiation, though, because, I mean, I remember when the day after showed on ABC or oh, yeah. that was some scary shit. But now it's like we have smart bombs, and you can throw them in a hole the size of this pitcher and blow up ten terrorists, but then you're not going to hurt anything else. 
So yeah, we're not really straight up. Against us in the same way, because China wants to make money off of us, so that's going to explode us. Right. So we don't we don't have it. We're Paris. We're going to do a dirty bomb in Philadelphia. Yeah. So you know that's going to be bad. Well, and yeah. any of that kind of thing has also moved to the thriller genre, genre instead of the horror. It's not a horror anymore. It's a scary thriller. The Chinese aren't going to bomb us. They're just bias. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary all on its own. Right here. Yeah. I was going to say. It seems to me that the Chinese are going to horror has more become a consequence of being human than is something done to us, like with the nature stuff. It's more variance on the, next, the darker parts of humanity. Somebody setting off the bomb. Oh yeah, we're, we're, we're owning our own uh, dark side. And mm -hmm. A lot of horror is, ex is exploring that, yeah, absolutely. Even in the supernatural, I mean, my favorite horror movie is Star of Echoes, which is completely about some people did some bad shit, and now there's scary stuff going on. I think every uh, slasher movie, and the couple that goes off to hook up, what happens to them? They're usually yeah. the first to go. <laughs> yes. The same. <laughs> I'm wondering what you think of the phenomenon of monsters fighting monsters. And I'm thinking of, um, of Hellboy and of Blade, where it's not people facing off <coughs> against monsters, it's other monsters. And, and is there a reason you think we select monsters to fight monsters sometimes, rather than people? Oh. Oh. I think it's, it's because we can identify with the fallible human. You know, we, we all have the dark side. We all have that thing that's wrong with us. And I think it's really refreshing and comforting to think that even though we have weaknesses, and we have monsters inside of us, we could still stand up and fight something and take something on. The, the triumph of free will. Yeah. But I think and that commingled with everybody's been an outsider, everybody's been the ugly duckling. So, like Hellboy, yeah. um, the idea that the, the ugly duckling can not only be accepted, but can be the hero, and by their choice, not just be victim to somebody else's design, but stand up and. Yes. Yeah, yeah Hellboy. Sorry. Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, who first? I was gonna say. I was gonna say. I disagree that everybody considers that they have been that. Most now, I'm people. just gonna say that. No, I think that I disagree with that too. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's no, That's no, 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 no. And I don't mean that that way. But I mean, if you've ever been in high school and so forth, I think you, that that there's a lot of insecurity. But I think it's become acceptable to be the other in a way it isn't. And people who are the other have gotten into positions in Hollywood and in publishing to allow there to be stories where monsters you have, where monsters are the heroes. Yeah, and also, Which wasn't before yeah. because everybody had to be, you know, the beautiful people and that's so forth. And you have, that, 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 that that's part of what's what's changed. I think everybody probably, if they really admitted it, a lot of people would admit that they've ever been an outsider because they were too damn popular. And it's connected to that to a yeah, degree. Connected to that to a degree is also the fact that you know because of therapy and other and, and other things that allow us to come back from our personal darkness, um, redemption stories are often part of monster against monster. Uh, uh, not necessarily at, at, always at the outset, but they're they're often an element of it. Um, you know, somebody who's working off their own. Blade is a good example. Um, uh, there's one. Um, Character's name was Nick Knight. Was it Forever Knight? Yeah, Forever. Um, you know, he's working off the evil. The dead, it's Spike and Angel working off the evil that they did. Um, so they're monsters who are trying to, to uh, become accepted again. The tone. Yeah, the tone. And yeah. and the, that's actually there's there's connections in folklore. The Strigoi Benefici, um, who are vampires who were essentially uh, given interventions and given a chance to to redeem their souls by fighting for the church. Uh, and the, the Ben and Dante, the, the good uh, the good walkers, werewolves who who, who would send them to hell to fight monsters, you know they're they're from folklore, and so we're we're basing that on 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 monster uh, types that are also part of our own legends. It's not something necessarily new. Well, and like Hellboy, it, it's it's the damaged nobility. It's a speaking about humanity and atonement. Like they said, you're not, you know, he was born a devil and now he's becoming as human as he can be. And I think that's what it's, we're owning as much of that nobility as we can in those stories, symbolically. So. Well, I just want to combine the answer of the previous question and the previous three questions before, where uh, making more continuous, 
And one question was, um, why are the giant ants not the monsters anymore? Well, it's more interesting if the, the vampires were interesting because you as a human could become a vampire, becoming a monster, then answering the, then answering the previous question, well, you have a chance of redemption. So it's a more interesting story that I could, or we could become monsters, but we could also redeem it ourselves. It's a lot more interesting than almost okay. a giant spider. Yeah, I'm with you on that whole idea. There was somebody else over here on the side that had a question. Oh, quick question. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, and I was Very good point, and yeah, definitely. My parallel there was definitely more about the the science gone wrong. Like the somebody, like I was really thinking of, of you know the you know the character of Doctor Frankenstein, like him, you know, pushing for this thing to happen, and then the results. But you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's it is a very different creature. sometimes redeemed and turned into the hero, such as in Neil Gaiman's Snow Glass Apples. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting too, that you can have that turnaround, that villain side, and we just talked about, you know, the outside of the monster becomes the hero. And that does seem to be happening a lot more and can be very interesting. And it really, I think, speaks to us being more comfortable with people being different. And I just I could also say, look at Dragon Con now. How many people are here? Go to Dragon Con in the early 90s, how many, go to any science fiction convention, how many people were there? You know, it's really much more accepted now to be another and be proud of it versus having to hide behind and, you know, I went to high school. <laughs> Not popular. So. We're about out of time, but I'd like our uh, panelists to be able to tell you briefly where you can find them during the rest of the con. Let me just mention, we were talking about Lovecraft earlier. There's actually a Lovecraft panel at 10 o'clock in this room. So anyway, um, James, go ahead. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be mostly in this track at some point doing stuff all day. Um, Sunday I will be in some panels. I also will be in the exhibitor booth 100 and 102, which is where you can pick up my books if you'd like. And I have a reading at four, an autograph session at four, and a reading at five thirty on Sunday. So, and anytime you see me wandering around, feel free to, hey, I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm also on a boatload of panels uh, this weekend. Um, I've got a, the, 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 my novel Rotten Ruin, a teenage uh, post-apocalyptic novel, is one of the book club reads for Dragon Con. So we're doing that tomorrow at ten, and uh, at four I'm doing a signing with. Uh, Lost Volume for Flesh and Bone, my new novel, which they have three weeks before anyone else in the world. I'm not sure exactly how the day. And also my no my uh, anthology, V Wars, uh, they have, and an autograph session on Sunday at 1. So I hope to see some of you guys out there. Uh, I have a booth with my band, Ego Likeness. It's in the Marriott on a 
level just below the lobby where all the band tables are set up, and I, I have copies of my books there. And um, we're actually playing in the atrium ballroom at the Marriott very late Sunday night, early Monday morning, at 1.30. Um, we'll be on stage. So. I have two panels tomorrow. I'm now an uh, addition to the Strong Women in Comics panel at 11.30 in Hanover. And I'm going to be talking about Womenthology, which has been an incredible experience. 150 women, co comics anthology, my story is a horror story. So as I said, and if anybody's interested in finding out more about a stuffed bunny in Dollland, I do have these flyers you can get to have one. And you can go to a stuffed bunny in Dollland.com or HoneyMartin.com as well to keep up with stuff. And also tomorrow I'm at 5.30 here in the panels on heroism and sacrifice. I will, I guess I'll probably be, the theme of uh, Womanthology was heroic. So I think I'll probably be talking a little bit about then that as well. And if anyone's interested in a copy of that book, talk to me, I've got a few here at the con. Not with me tonight, but you know. I'm on the X track tomorrow. I've got a one o'clock and a five thirty book for the show Supernatural. Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you.